Outside is your smiling faces. I hear rumors that there are robins flying around. I haven't seen them yet, but I know that spring is close. We just need three more snows on a robin's back. Apparently, that's how it works out here in Minnesota. So I'm getting excited, ready to go winter in the closet and bring out those spring clothes, which is mud boots and a rain jacket. <laughs> A bit of sad news, Larry Grimius passed away last week. His visitation for, for Grimius will be at 9.30 this Tuesday at the Presbyterian Church in Iona. <clears throat> A private service will then follow at 10.30. Yes, I think we got Miller Yachting Road. Yes. Brother and um, they got on the screen that it's 9 and 10 o'clock and they said they got that from Pat Steve's information over the thing so okay if it's at 10 o'clock then people have to be there at hour. Uh, a correction to that i'll just inform that it's um there's two notes so i'm going to go with the earlier one just to be safe uh, visitation is at nine o'clock with the funeral service at 10 o'clock and that is at the ionian uh, presbyterian church so our Condolences go out to the Grimius family. Though we, even though we are sad, we are joyful because another hero of faith has returned home. We're also joyful because we celebrate a birthday today. Don wants to say happy birthday to his mother who turns 82 today. Now, I'm not brave enough to say this woman's name and broadcast her age out to the internet, but Don wants to say happy birthday to his mother, who turns 82 today. So, happy birthday, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and apparently Leroy's birthday as well? No. Tomorrow, okay. <laughs> well, it's not as much fun to make fun of uh, old guys who get older. <laughs> Our call to worship is a reading of Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs praise forever. Brothers and sisters, we please rise and join me in giving praise to our mighty God.
brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of Christ be with you all. As God has welcomed you here today, please turn to your neighbor and welcome them. Please join me in a, responsive re in a responsive reading of the law. Hear, O people of God, the law which the Lord speaks in your hearing this day, that you may know his statutes and walk according to his ordinances. Jesus, O Lord, the grace of your law, and give us life by your word. The God who saved us in Jesus Christ gave this law, saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. We will worship the Lord our God and serve only him. You shall not make yourself an image of anything and worship it. Living no more in bondage to earthly gods, we will worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. We will use the holy name of God with reverence, praising Him in everything we do and say. You shall observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy, for on six days you shall labor and do all your work. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The first part of the law is this great commandment. That we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our strength. The second part of the law is similar to the first. You shall honor your father and mother, that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. As children we will be obedient to our parents and the Lord. As parents, we will correct our children and guide them in the training and instruction of the Lord. We will respect the lawful authorities appointed by God. You shall not murder. We will be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave us. You shall not commit adultery. We will use our bodies in ways that are holy and honorable, and abstain from immorality and impurity. You shall not steal. We will do what we can for our neighbor's work and work with you so that we may share with the poor. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. We will speak the truth with our neighbor in love, render judgments that are true, and make for peace, and not devise in our hearts any evil against anyone. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. We will be content whatever the circumstances to the strength of Christ within us. Thus we must love our neighbor as ourselves. For the Lord requires of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we know that we cannot perfectly fulfill this law, but we have the assurance that when we go before our Lord, he grants us forgiveness and renews our spirit. So let us go before our Lord and make a confession of our sins. Will you please join me in prayer? Most merciful God, whose Son is Jesus Christ our Lord, He who was tempted in every way, and yet Jesus was without sin, we confess before you our own sinfulness. We have hungered after that which does not satisfy. We have compromised with evil. We have doubted your power to protect us. Forgive our lack of faith, have mercy on our weakness. Restore to us trust and love, so that we may walk in your ways and delight in doing your will.
the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thus says the Lord, those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them and show them my salvation. Brothers and sisters, receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We please join me in a hymn of thanks as we sing number 494, It Took a Miracle. I forgot to put in the bulletin again that we have a Lenten prayer service Wednesday, so those prayer services continue at 6.30. This is the third week of Lent, so will you please join us on our journey to Easter. Our scripture reading today is Hebrews chapter 11, but first let us pray that the Spirit will loom in our room. Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Ghost. O oh Lord, I thank you that you have gathered us here today, so that we may join as one body to worship you, to hear your word and grow in faith. Holy Spirit, I pray that you continue to give us faith, hope, and love, so that we may grow in the maturity of our faith, so that we may continue to share the good news of Jesus Christ and praise his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that, it will, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with them of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea, as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell, after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. 
Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This is the word of the Lord. So long chapter I gotta Well as you all know by now, I like to take my family camping. I like to go to new places and see new things, and I like to be comfortable while doing it. And so the summer after we bought our camper, we took it out west to visit our family in Oregon and Washington. So we drove through North Dakota and Montana, went across three different mountain ranges. This wasn't a big deal because we mostly stuck to the interstates, but though I did cry a little bit every time I had to stop for gas. Like I said, we like to go to new places, so on the return trip home, I decided to take a different route. I wanted to see something different, so we went through southern Idaho and drove through the Grand Tetons before angling up through Wyoming and eventually getting back on the 90. But this time we, and by that I mean I, didn't stick to the interstates. I went on, I went on state highways and county roads, and this means instead of the nice, well-maintained and wide interstate, I was on narrow roads with way more potholes steeper slopes and sharper switchbacks. Now, if it was just me and the truck, this wouldn't have been a big deal, but I was pulling a 30-foot trailer behind me, and it can be a little scary when you're coming down from 14,000 feet and there's a 2,000-foot drop right next to you, and you're not quite sure if you're handling that trailer behind you just right. And so while I still look forward to traveling with our camper, I'm probably not going to go over any mountain ranges anytime soon. The camper makes travel comfortable, but it does kind of limit where you can go. Now, contrast that kind of travel with what I did when I was in the Navy. When I was in the Navy, I learned how to travel light. Everything that I would travel with could fit in my sea bag, which is a canvas bag about so big and military green. Now, the Navy likes to tell their sailors if it doesn't fit in your sea bag, you don't need it because the Navy doesn't want sailors who are tied down by things like homes and wives and children and other earthly possessions. If it doesn't fit in the sea bag, you don't need it. Now, the Navy wants sailors like this because the Navy is a global organization. They could send you anywhere at any time and you need to be able to go when that time comes. This kind of travel can be quite uncomfortable but it is empowering because when you put on the Navy uniform, you're no longer an ordinary citizen. You are part of something bigger. You travel with the might of the United States and you never travel alone. This is similar to our walk with God. When we wear the clothes of Christ, we become his masters. We go with the power of the Holy Spirit. And at any time, God might send us anywhere into the world to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, to share the good news of repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation. But if we're going to live that way, we need to live by faith, and we need to learn how to travel light. But to better understand that, let us take another look at Hebrews chapter 11. Well, we finally got to Hebrews chapter 11, the most famous chapter in this entire book. I would dare say that there are many Christians out there who only know about chapter 11, completely ignoring the first 10 chapters, which is kind of sad because the first 10, 
first 10 chapters are amazing as they teach us over and over and over again that Jesus is better. Now, that right there is good enough sermon. Jesus is better. Let's all go home. But there is an amazing conclusion to what Paul has been writing us to us. Jesus is better, therefore we are better. Now when Paul finished up chapter 10, he ended with the verse which said, We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. This, of course, begs the question, what does it mean to be, to live by faith and to be saved? What does it mean for us to believe? How are we to live by faith? Well, chapter 11 answers that question. And the answer to that question is quite startling. We live by faith because we are better. Why am I able to say this? Well, at the very end of chapter 11, Paul writes, after he listed all of those great heroes that we read about in the Old Testament, he declares that they were not made perfect, at least not in their own lives. Paul declares that God's plan was something better for us, so that only together with us, that those great heroes would be able to be made perfect. Meaning that we are able to live a life of faith that is even greater than those heroes we read about in the Old Testament. And what a list of heroes we get. We get everybody from the book of Genesis. We get, we skip Adam and Eve, but we jump right into Abel, who by faith offered up a better sacrifice. We learn about Enoch, who lived such a good life that God saved him from death and raised him up to heaven. Now let's stop and think about this for a moment. Enoch was so good that God raised him up to heaven without letting him taste death. And yet we are able to live a better life than Enoch. Why? Because we are ambassadors for Christ. We have the Holy Spirit given to us from Jesus. So even though God saw that Enoch was a good man and commended him for his faithful living, Enoch was not made perfect, even though he was brought up to heaven. Enoch was not made perfect until we show up. That is God's plan for our lives. By faith, Noah, when he heard that the world was going to be destroyed, built the ark and saved himself and his family and the animals. And Paul writes that by faith, Noah condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now Noah was able to let go of the world and seek after God's kingdom, and because of that the world was condemned. But also let us remember that because Noah was faithful, the world was saved. Such, such is a life lived by faith, letting go of the world, condemning it, so that it can be saved in the end. By faith, Abraham followed God's voice. He left his home, he left his riches and wealth and even family behind in Ur and traveled to the, well, for him, would have been the other side of the world, all the way over to the Promised Land. And even though God promised Abraham that the land that he was walking on would be his and would belong to his descendants, Abraham never experienced the fulfillment of those promises. And quite amazing, when the day came when Abraham had his son, the promised son, why, God gave him the command to sacrifice his son. I can't imagine the agony that Abraham must have went through, but he faithfully followed God's law. As Paul writes, Abraham reasoned that God is greater than death. They could return to Abraham his son Isaac. In a way, that's exactly what happened. God prevented Abraham from following through, and, for, and God himself provided the lamb. But even then, that great act of faith did not make Abraham perfect. He did not receive the fulfillment of the promise. He still was looking ahead to the heavenly kingdom, to the heavenly city and its heavenly people. He was looking ahead to us. Abraham lived by faith, Isaac lived by faith, and by faith, Isaac blessed his children. Jacob also lived by faith. 
Now that might be a kind of a strange sense to say as we read about Jacob's life and how he was constantly trying to get one over on his family, taking his brother's inheritance and struggling with his father-in-law. We read Jacob's life and he's constantly running around and running away from his problems. Yet at the end of Jacob's life, after he had wrestled with God and received the name of Israel, Jacob lived by faith, by blessing his children. One of his children, Joseph, lived by faith. We certainly know Joseph's story quite well. His coat's many colors, being sold by his brothers into slavery, all the troubles and adventures he had in Egypt before eventually rising to be second in command with only Pharaoh himself over Egypt, Joseph. Joseph had the entire world in the palm of his hands, but he did not let that wealth and power distract him from who was really in control. Joseph lived by faith and gave his life to God. He's, and because of his faithful living, he was able to save the lives of many people when the famine came. But more importantly, he was able to speak a blessing to his brothers and to his children as he lay dying. He told them the trouble that they were about to experience in the coming years and gave them encouragement and hope so that they would be able to persevere when times turn really tough. And with that hope passed down from generation to generation, Moses' parents were able to live by faith, disobeying the law of the land, disobeying Pharaoh in order to save the life of their son. And what a son they had. Moses himself lived by faith, again, rejecting the wealth and privilege that came from a life in the palace, to live a life out in the wilderness, herding sheep and goats. And he lived a life of faith by going back to Egypt, even though the rulers there wanted him dead, in order to bring his people out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. By faith, he led the people. Often he struggled with them. But every day, God went before Moses, and Moses followed. By faith, they went through the Red Sea. By faith, the people eventually entered into the Promised Land. They saw the walls of Jericho fall. And by faith, one of the citizens of Jericho, a prostitute named Rahab, joined with the people of Israel. She knew that the world that she called home was about to end. Much like Noah, by faith, she condemned her city by rejecting it and seeking God's kingdom. And in so doing, she was able to save the world that she turned her back on. Now, Paul doesn't tell us here, but for those of us who know our Bible knowledge, Rahab is in the line of Jesus. Through her, eventually we get to one of her descendants is David, and one of David's descendants, of course, is Jesus Christ. And so we have a pagan woman, a prostitute even, who turned her back on the world that she lived in, and she became part of God's kingdom and his plan of salvation. And yet, even though she was such a person who could live by faith, she also was not made perfect. That is, she was not made perfect until the church came into this world. And we are able to live a life of faith much greater and more miraculous than Rahab's life. And I don't have time to go through all of these heroes, and neither does Paul. We read about Gideon and Barak. We read about prophets and judges and kings, people who defied the world, people who accepted persecution, torment, torture, even death. Now Paul is being quite clever here. In chapter 10, he reminded his readers that, remember your early days when you had the joy of salvation, when you were being persecuted, when you allowed your property to be taken away and you visited people in jail. And now he's seamlessly woven these together. Just as the heroes of old suffered persecution, so also you today suffer persecution. God's plan of salvation continues from generation to generation, and it always involves his people rejecting the world and testifying to something better. That better, of course, is Jesus and his kingdom 
and today that kingdom is here in his church. So when we testify by Jesus, we also live a life of faith that is better than this world. And when we are powered by the Holy Spirit, we live a life of faith that is even better than the heroes we read about in the Old Testament. Indeed, we are the fulfillment of their faith. Not necessarily us, per se, but God's plan of salvation working in our lives is the fulfillment of the hope that they look forward to. The church is that kingdom that Jesus himself is building. He has laid the foundation of that holy city that Abraham was looking forward to. Now, when I read this list of heroes, when I read about the persecutions they endure, when I read about the martyrs of the early church and how they also endured persecutions and torment, when they allowed their property to be confiscated, and when they sang hymns on their way to death, I read about their lives and I look at my life and I notice that my life is quite different from their life. Nobody is throwing stones at me. I'm not in danger of being sawed in half or being beheaded by the sword. Nobody is forcing me to worship an idol and threatening that I'd be tossed into a fire. I'm not going to be crucified the way many of our brothers and sisters did when Nero was Emperor of Rome. In many ways, I have a comfortable life. I'm traveling around with a camper, spiritually speaking. Now, on one hand, this is not a bad thing. It's not my fault the world isn't as evil as it could be. Indeed, we could look at the comfort that we have today and see God's plan of salvation working in the world. Because our brothers and sisters in the past were faithful, even to the point of death, the world learned about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the world began to repent of its violence in mad ways. And so we don't have emperors like Nero burning people in tar, drowning people in oil, or beheading troublemakers like Paul with the sword. But yet the world is still full of violence and menace. The world still needs the church to live by faith and share the good news of the gospel. This, of course, raises the question, what, then what are the things that slow us down? What is the baggage that we need to let go of in order to travel light? What are the things that hinder us from living a life of faith? One of the answers, I believe, comes from Jesus himself. When he was having a discussion with religious leaders about what makes a person clean and unclean, Jesus declares that it is the things that come out of a person's mouth, those things which come from the heart that truly defile a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. And so we must ask ourselves, what causes these things? Well, in my life, what causes me to have violent thoughts, to lust after things that are not my own, things that tempt me to steal, that would be why my own heart, the anger that is in my heart. Maybe it's a righteous anger. I see an injustice happen, and I want to get in there and fight and even kill the enemies causing that that injustice. It is hurt. I feel hurt, and I want reparations, and I want to do it myself. I hold grudges. I am greedy. I see that other people have wealth and privileges that I don't have, and I want what they have. I want to have enough. And that doesn't mean that I want my daily bread. No, it means I don't want others to have more than me. I don't want to have less than anyone else. I don't want to be left out. So how do I move forward from this? Why am I traveling light? By accepting the good gifts from God and letting go of the things of this world. Much like Noah and Rahab and Moses, let go of the world, for it is going to be destroyed. Now, logically speaking, this is a no-brainer. If the world is going to be destroyed with the flood, get into the boat. 
if the city walls are going to crumble down, get out of the city and join the people marching around it. If this world is going to end, if it's going to end with the fire of God's judgment, why get in God's boat today? It's a no-brainer. Yet what keeps us out of that boat is the violence and madness in our own hearts. So how do we learn to let go of the things that hinder us from living a life of faith? And my answer to that would be, well, one, encouraging one another and learning from Jesus himself through the Lord's Prayer. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole Lord's Prayer today, but let's stop and think about how it flows. It begins with praising God. It then moves to praying that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is seeking after God's will. And then there's a great prayer that, oh God, forgive us as we forgive those who persecute us. And then we ask for our daily bread. And then we ask for protection from evil and temptation. Now, I don't know about you, but I often pray this prayer backwards. Oh, sure, I address God and give him glory, but then I start asking that God will protect me from bad things. And I start asking that God will give me my daily bread and that then God will forgive me. And then I'll probably skip over the fact that I haven't really forgave anybody else. And I'm not asking that God's will be done in my life. I keep asking for things. And I admit I do this way more often than I should. Which is why I'm glad that Jesus gave us this prayer. A tool to help us discipline ourselves. To mature our faith. So what, when our life is put to the test. When we face troubles and persecutions, we won't act out of fear, but rather we will live by faith. We'll be able to withstand those stones and those swords. We'll be able to praise God, and we ask that God's will be done. And then we will ask God to forgive those who are persecuting us because they don't know what they're doing. And then we'll ask God to forgive us, to give us our daily bread, and protect us from evil. That is how we let go of this world, to let go of our violence and our greed and our envy, and to seek first the kingdom of God. So brothers and sisters, I encourage you this week, as you go about your work and you live your life, remember the heroes of faith in the Old Testament, and remember that because of Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit, we are able to live a life of faith that is better than the heroes of old. Not for our own glory, but we live a better life for the glory of God, so that His will will be done, so that we will be able to forgive the world when it hurts us, and so we also receive forgiveness from Jesus Christ. Let us continue to worship God so that we'll be able to enjoy the daily bread without being envious of the wealth others have, and we'll be able to fearfully withstand the devil and resist the forces of persecution and injustice in the world. Because brothers and sisters, even though the world has come a long way from the violent days of Rome and those other early empires, the news still testifies to the fact that the world is still full of violence and madness, and the world still needs healing and forgiveness. And forgiveness. So let us be ambassadors of Christ, bringing his healing and his forgiveness wherever we go. And may the name of Jesus Christ be praised, now and forever. Will you please join me in prayer? Holy God, Lord, I thank you for this word, and I pray that it will be bread for our hearts and our souls. And I pray that your spirit will give us a spirit of joy that is built upon faith, hope, and love. So, Lord, I pray that your will will be done in our lives and the lives of all of the people of this world. Teach us, Lord, to forgive as you have forgiven us. Teach us, Lord, to accept your bread and to trust that you will protect us from the evil of this world. And teach us, Lord, to walk by faith, now and forever we pray. Will you please rise in spirit or in body as we sing our hymn of response? <laughs>
this time, I invite our deacons to come forward and lead us in the giving of our gifts. birthday mom remember you told me uh we was only 28 backwards <laughs> so shall we pray dear heavenly father we'd like to thank you once again for giving us the opportunity to come to your house and worship and praise you we thank you lord for the beautiful weather which all sent us we thank you for the sunshine and the birds returning we ask now lord that you will bless this offering which we are about to receive be with us further throughout the remainder of the upcoming week Keep us from harm and danger. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Just as we bring our gifts to the Lord, let us also bring before him our prayers. Holy Father, creator of heaven and earth, I thank you for this day that you have made. I thank you that you have given us your, your name, a name that is glorious and powerful. Oh Lord, I pray that your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. 
that the glories and peace and justice and righteousness that reigns above will reign here on earth as well. So Lord, I thank you that you have sent us your Holy Spirit and your Son. Jesus Christ, I thank you for being our Lord and God. You reign over our lives from the throne of God. I thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven us of our sins, you have cleansed us of our iniquities, and you have restored to us the joy of our salvation. So I pray, Lord, with this joy that we will go out to the world, that we will let go of our own sins, our guilt, our grudges, that we'll be able to forgive ourselves and we'll be able to forgive our neighbors, sharing with them the good news of your name. Jesus Christ, I thank you that you have sent us your Holy Spirit to provide for our daily needs. You give us our daily bread and a place to sleep at night. You give us work to do every day. And I pray, Lord, that our work will be pleasing to you. And that through us, Lord, your spirit will continue to shine the light of the gospel, banishing the darkness, defeating evil, and setting the forces of hell running. Lord, we know that everything has been laid at your feet, but King Jesus, we do not see everything yet in submission to your will. Jesus, I pray that you will come and bring your peace. We pray for the people in Ukraine who are suffering invasion right now, bombs and missiles and bullets, uncertainty and death. I pray that your spirit will give them comfort, that you'll raise up men and women who will live by faith, showing that there is a better way to live. Lord, we also pray for those Russian soldiers who are being forced into a war, often against their own will. I pray, Lord, that you'll give them a faith that it will enable them to stand up and reject their rulers and disobey the evil commands that they have been given. Lord, I also pray for the rest of this world, for everywhere and in every corner of this world we can find examples of violence and madness. We see injustice and persecution. So Lord, send your spirit to put an end to that evil. So Lord, I thank you that you raise up men and women we thank you for the Bruxfords and the Hubers and the Lord Silvas, that they have faithfully followed your calling and, that, and they travel light out into the world so that they can see your kingdom come from Romania to Ethiopia to Alaska. Your kingdom is coming. And I pray, Jesus, that you will also give us maturity of faith so that we can also travel light here in Chairman that we can share the good news of your gospel with all of our neighbors and everyone we work with. For your grace and mercy flows from generation to generation. Lord, we pray for the Grimmies family and say, say goodbye to Larry. I thank you for the life that he lived, and I thank you that this hero of faith is able to journey home and see the promises perfectly fulfilled as you sit upon the throne. And I pray, Lord, that the faith that he had will continue to flow from generation to generation, that we may look to our elders and be inspired, and we can look to our children and see that your goodness and faithfulness and promises continue to bear good fruit in this world. Jesus, continue to give us your spirit, so that we may pass on that spirit to our children, so that they may know of the good news of Jesus Christ. And that they themselves will be able to grow and mature in faith, hope, and love. And so become the heroes of tomorrow that this world so desperately needs. And Jesus, we lay our country at your feet. We, put the, we lay before you our, our government, our politicians, our lawyers and judges, our governors, our state officials, we lay before you all of our needs and our wants and our worries and our fears. We give you our country as a sacrifice, Lord. And I pray that you'll take it from our hands so that we may not so much reject our country, but in giving it to you, Lord, we may see that it is safe. That we will, like those women we read about who received back their death, receive back the country that is pure and holy, a country that does justice, walks humbly, and praises your name. And until the day comes, Lord, when we can rest and lay down this burden, 
I pray that we will walk by faith, that we'll walk even in the face of persecution and torment, Lord, that we'll continue to be faithful and endure. For your kingdom is a forever kingdom, and I thank you that we are citizens of that kingdom. May your name be glorified, now and forever, we pray. Amen. We please rise and finish our time of prayer by singing our doxology. heroes of faith. So go out, living a life that is pleasing to God. As we conclude our time of worship, we're going to do things a little bit differently than normal. We are going to sing number 732, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, and then following our benediction, we will sing number 410, Standing on the Promises. shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you and give you peace. <laughs>